Okay, good afternoon. Uh, this is Tim Lodge from the University of Minnesota, Department of Chemistry and Department of Chemical Engineering and Material Science. I'm going to uh, present a second lecture today on applications of small angle neutron scattering to polymers. And uh, welcome back, uh, those of you who uh, came to on, listen in on Tuesday. So just a quick reminder of the outline. Last time we talked about the form factors of individual polymer molecules and also about mixtures of polymers, polymer blends. Uh, today the focus will be on block copolymers. So this is a slide that we had early on last time, but it's worth reviewing uh, the main attributes of neutron scattering with respect to polymers and how this pertains particularly to the case of block polymers. So the first thing uh, we pointed out is neutrons interact weakly with organic materials. So when we have carbon, nitrogen, deuterium, nitrogen, oxygen, uh, we don't have to worry too much about absorption or creation of uh, radioactive species. Uh, typically, uh, sample thicknesses range from a millimeter to a centimeter. That's dictated uh, in practice largely by the amount of hydrogen in the sample. The incoherent scattering from hydrogen uh, is typically the limiting uh, feature. Uh, so if it's mostly a hydrogenous material, you'd be closer to the millimeter sample thickness. The readily accessible Q range with small angle neutron scattering is 0.01 inverse angstroms to 1. Uh, and as pointed out last time, this matches the polymer size scale uh, perfectly. And that's uh, particularly true for block copolymers. Because as we'll see, uh, block copolymers uh, will self-assemble into nanostructured materials in which the individual blocks of different types don't mix much. And this naturally creates a preferred length scale in the material, uh, which is in this range. So we will uh, see the effects of that. Uh, again, as with uh, the polymer blends and solutions we talked about last time, uh, the main reason, the main advantage for neutron scattering here is that hydrogen and deuterium uh, scatter so differently, uh, and although, as we noted last time, there is a non-zero thermodynamic difference between a protonated and a perdeuterated polymer, uh, this is understood and can be uh, controlled for, and in the case of block polymers, is a relatively, uh, usually a relatively modest effect. Again, as we saw last time, uh, this ability to label uh, either with hydrogen in the deuterated background or more commonly with deuterium in the hydrogenous background, uh, you, are, you have the possibility to look at the size, the conformation, the distribution of individual polymers or parts of polymers in uh, mixtures or environments of relatively uh, arbitrary complexity. Uh, and so today, uh, with block polymers, uh, you can certainly imagine putting deuterium in one of the blocks uh, and getting strong contrast. Now we made this point, and I'm going to make it again in today's lecture about small angle x-ray scattering. It has, uh, particularly when you're considering a synchrotron source, it has orders of magnitude higher flux and much better uh, resolution, uh, which in this case is a combination of the wavelength resolution, the delta lambda, but also the angular resolution or the collimation of the beam. So this plays an important role uh, in one aspect of studying block polymers, which we'll, we'll get to. OK, so that's uh, a review of some of these important points. So now we can uh, turn our attention to block copolymers. And Last time, in the context of mixtures, we explored the thermodynamics uh, in the context of mean field theory or Flory-Huggins theory. Uh, today, the 
block copolymers will also be considered in the context of mean field theory, but no longer is, is Flory Huggins theory the appropriate uh, model to use. So the theoretical treatment of a molecule like this, which is a dye block of an A polymer of A covalently linked to a polymer of monomer B, uh, the thermodynamics are dominated, not 100% settled, but dominated by three parameters. So the first, again, is the degree of polymerization. Uh, and the total degree of polymerization N uh, has the degree of polymerization of the A block and the B block. And I'll just remind you, uh, when calculating radii of gyration, we might use the chemical degree of polymerization and the statistical segment length that you can look up. But in the case of thermodynamics, we want to make sure that these separate ends are defined in the basis of a common reference volume, which might be that of either of the monomers or uh, some average of the two. It will turn out that the entropy uh, in a, a block polymer system, as we'll see shortly, uh, is proportional to 1 over n. This was also true in the case of Flory Huggins theory. The free energy mixing had the ideal entropy of mixing in it, which were inversely proportional to degree of polymerization. But the entropy we're talking about here is different. It still has the same scaling uh, on molecular weight. And instead of talking about the volume fraction of a component in a mixture, we'll now talk about the volume fraction of the first block. And we'll call that script F sub A. And so because we have defined these degrees of polymerization on the basis of a common reference volume, uh, the volumetric composition is just this uh, uh, fraction of degree of polymerization. And then last, but uh, most important perhaps, is the segment-segment interaction. And again, we'll be using chi. Uh, and again, this is, in principle, the same chi as we have considered in uh, the Flory Huggins theory for mixtures. Only now we're talking about contacts uh, between two monomers A and B uh, that may be uh, on the same molecule. So again, I remind you that in the original theory, this is an entirely enthalpic quantity. It depends on the lattice coordination number and the exchange energy. So how much energy does it cost? to mix uh, one block, sorry, one segment of A uh, with one segment of B, normalized by KT. Uh, and I'll remind you uh, from last time that uh, these values of chi uh, empirically are, are typically in the range of something like uh, 0.01 to 0.1, or, or maybe somewhat larger. Uh, and in the case of isotopes, uh, hydrogen and deuterium, the polymers have a chi uh, protonated and deuterated that's in the order of 5 times 10 to the minus 4, something like that. Uh, and again, experimentally, uh, people use the mean field theory but they to fit some experimental observable, but they allow chi to become an excess free energy function that acquires whatever attributes are necessary to describe the data. And in particular, uh, chi as found always has, or almost always has, a enthalpic part proportional to inverse temperature, but also an excess entropy part uh, that's not accounted for otherwise. So that's, uh, that's the starting point. Uh, so there are uh, two sort of main questions we could ask about a block copolymer in the bulk state. One is, uh, will it be an ordered phase or a disordered phase? And if it's an ordered phase, what will the symmetry be? So to consider how to answer those questions, uh, it's good to, to sort of review some sort of general uh, physical principles that underlie self-assembly. So there's a cartoon here, which is meant to represent a uh, block polymer system with red blocks and brown blocks and the red blocks have spontaneously aggregated into what might be spherical things or they might be cylindrical things viewed head-on 
that there's a, a characteristic distance here, d, uh, which we might call uh, domain periodicity. So the rules that dictate this structure are the following. First, you have to fill space, obviously. Uh, no vacuum allowed. Uh, and the best way to do that efficiently is by a periodic structure. So it'll form some kind of a long-range lattice. The next thing is you want to minimize the interfacial area. So these things have self-assembled, or another term people use is microphase separated, uh, such that the A blocks, the A segments are touching only A segments, and the B segments are touching only B segments. But inevitably, because there's a block junction, there must be an interface between A and B. And this interface has an interfacial energy associated with it. So the more interface there is, the more expensive it is. And the way to generically reduce the total amount of interface is to increase the spacing, push things further and further apart. On the other hand, we need to minimize chain stretching. And this is where the entropy comes in. The polymer coil all things being equal, would like to be uh, Gaussian or random walk uh, because that has the most disorder, the most entropy. So as D gets bigger and you still try to fill space, these brown chains must stretch out, and so they give up entropy. So there's a competition between interfacial area that costs energy and chain stretching that costs entropy. The other aspect that comes in that helps determine which ordered phase you select is uh, to approximate the spontaneous curvature. And what I've indicated here is that the red or A blocks are generally smaller than the brown or B blocks. So the B blocks want to occupy more space, and so that makes the interface have a curvature, which in this case has encouraged the smaller block to either be in a spherical domain or a cylindrical domain. So those are the rules. Uh, we can make this uh, much more quantitative. Uh, so let's concentrate on just the simplest structure, which is a lamellar phase, alternating layers uh, of the two blocks. Uh, this is uh, in the language of liquid crystals, a, a smectic phase. Uh, you could think of it as a one-dimensional solid in the, this direction and a two-dimensional liquid in the, in the other two in the plane. So let's uh, consider two quantities, the interfacial area per chain, which we'll call capital sigma, and the entropy is now the configurational entropy of a single chain, not the mixing entropy of two components, as we had last time. So if we have uh, an interface here that I'm showing a blue side and another interface that's a red side, and then there's the periodicity D. So if we had no stretching, each block would be a random walk. Its end-to-end -end distance would scale with the square root of molecular weight, just like we saw last time. That's the random walk result. So this configuration, where d is proportional to square root of molecular weight, that will maximize the entropy of the individual blocks in terms of their conformations. But it also uh, has the effect of maximizing the amount of interfacial area there is per chain. So that's enthalpically or energetically expensive. The other limit is to stretch the chains out as fully as they can. That would give us a period that would be linear in molecular weight. So that's the largest it could be. If we did that, the amount of interfacial area per block, per chain, would be the smallest it could be. Because essentially, the only interface you would have would be the junction points on the, between the two blocks. So these are the limits and, of course, the ultimate uh, uh, experimental result is something in between. Analysis 
takes those two concepts <coughs> of the entropy of the blocks and the enthalpy due to the interface and constructs a free energy expression uh, that has in it uh, these two uh, contributions and also numerical prefactors. So the stretching goes as the square of the period divided by the unperturbed end-to-end -end distance, which is B times the square root of molecular weight. So this is the uh, entropic elasticity of a single Gaussian chain. It's the same thing that you see in the theory of rubber elasticity. And this uh, term accounts for the interface, which it turns out is proportional to the square root of the chi, the interaction parameter. And it depends on n and d because of this effect, uh, you know, how much interface you have per chain. And as you stretch it out, uh, there will be less interface. So as you make d bigger. So by simply finding the minimum of this free energy with respect to the spacing d. So just set this equation equal to zero. Sorry, take the derivative with respect to d and, and set it equal to zero. You find that the result is uh, that d is approximately equal to the statistical segment length times the sixth power of chi and the two-thirds power of molecular weight. So two-thirds power is in between the Gaussian result of a half and the fully stretched or rod-like result of one. So this is not, uh, in retrospect, this is not a surprising uh, answer at all. But it's interesting because this exponent of two-thirds is not one that you find uh, in other uh, considerations of polymers. It's not a half. Uh, it's not uh, three-fifths, which is what you would get in a good solvent. It's not a third, which you get in the collapse state. So it's a new scaling result. The other question uh, then is not uh, necessarily what the value of D is going to be, but what, where will the ordered disorder transition occur? Where will it, the system decide its free energy is lower to be ordered or disordered? So we can get a very simple answer for this. It's not quite right, but it's pretty good, uh, and that's the following. So we just considered the, entrop uh, sorry, the free energy of an ordered state involving per chain, uh, involving uh, the stretching, entropy, and the interfacial contact. The entropy of placement of polymers in three-dimensional space is not considered here because it's relatively small. And down here we have the free energy of the disordered state, a completely homogeneous mixture of red monomers and blue, which I've tried to illustrate here uh, as purple. So where does this expression come from? Well, this is nothing more than uh, the Flory Huggins theory. Uh, there's no, uh, well, the entropy of placing the chains in space is assumed to be the same as it is in the ordered state. So this is just accounting for contacts between monomers A and monomers B. And each one costs you chi. So if we simply set these two uh, free energies equal to one another and solve, we find that chi n, the product at that point, is 10.4. Uh, and I'll remind you that in the case of considering two polymers of degree of polymerization n, their critical point for phase separation as a binary mixture was chi n of 2. So this result says you have to make either the molecular weight bigger or the interaction parameter bigger to get the system to order into an ordered state than to have it phase separate if it were a, a two components. The more detailed mean field theory actually gives the answer 10.5. So this is a, a, a remarkably good estimate for such a simple uh, sort of back of the envelope calculation. Now, the uh, first quantitative theory of the block polymer 
phase diagram or phase map uh, was due to Leibler, this uh, famous paper, now 33 years ago, and he computed uh, a phase diagram that looks like this, plotted on the vertical axis is chi n, uh, and I'll just remind you that this is in some sense uh, the ratio of the enthalpy to the entropy, and because chi generally, but not always, but generally increases uh, with temperature, that means high temperature is down here at low chi n or low segregation strength, and high segregation strength or low temperature is up here. All of this region of the phase diagram is ordered states, and the order, this ordered transition for a 50 50 or symmetric die block occurs at 0.5 in composition and chi n of 10.5, as, as I just said. As you move off symmetry, uh, the disordered state is favored, just as it is in a uh, binary mixture. You move off the critical composition. But eventually, as you cool or increase chi n, the theory predicts that you'll first pack onto a BCC lattice. So that's this structure here. Then you'll pack onto a hexagonal lattice, so the minor component, and here it's about 25%, would be hexagonal. And then if you continue to increase chi or n or cool down, you'd eventually find the lamellar phase. And if you were at a 50-50 polymer, you'd go straight from a disordered state down here into the lamellar phase on coolant. Now, this theory uh, is uh, okay, but it, uh, it has limitations that are, are well known. And one of the topics that's been pursued extensively over the last intervening 30 years has been the use of the so-called self-consistent mean field theory, which uh, is not different from Leibler theory in terms of computing the ordered disorder transition, where do you go from an ordered, ordered state here to a disordered state, but it is more sophisticated and more accurate in computing which ordered phase you should uh, obtain. And the self-consistent mean field theory is a numerical scheme, uh, which is highly developed, I would say, at this point, uh, but it still is computationally intensive but it allows you to compare the free energies of any ordered phase. You will have to do a, uh, an explicit calculation for any symmetry that you want. But one of the most recent manifestations of this uh, is in this reference, which is uh, from 2006. And what it shows that's different from the Leibler diagram uh, is that actually the BCC phase is this one, but there's a thin band of a close-packed sphere phase. Uh, here I've shown this as FCC crystal. And that in between hexagonal and lamellar is a narrow channel of space group 230, which is the famous gyroid, bicontinuous double gyroid structure. And the calculation of this structure was based on its experimental observation. So in almost all cases, these kinds of self-consistent calculations are driven by experimental observation. There are 230 space groups, so it's prohibitive to try them all uh, numerically until you have some experimental justification for doing so. Uh, it's not the purpose of this lecture to go into all the gory details of this, and I'll tell you that there are other calculations that suggest even more complicated phases could be stable, uh, possibly down in this regime and out in the wings. But this is an ongoing uh, topic of research interest. Now, just one more point uh, to make before we sort of get into a little bit quantitative detail. So, so in, you know, what are we going to do with neutron scattering here? Well, uh, it's going to turn out we can ask some 
higher order questions about what's going on here, but in general, neutron scattering is not the preferred technique to discover which ordered phase we have. Uh, and I'll give you an example that illustrates that in a moment, but basically transmission electron microscopy is helpful, X-ray scattering is helpful, and in some cases rheology and biorefringence are also helpful. So neutron scattering is probably not the best choice to decide which ordered phase we have. On the other hand, uh, we can use it to ask some detailed questions, and I'll give some examples of that. But out here, in the disordered state, uh, it's by far the, uh, the most important technique. And again, this comes from the deuterium-hydrogen contrast advantages. So here is just an example of why uh, you might not use neutron scattering to identify the phase structure. So this is a paper uh, Thomas Epps and, and co-workers, almost 10 years old, they prepared a whole series of tri-blocks of polyisoprene, polystyrene, and polyethylene oxide. So these are going to form uh, potentially many more complicated structures than the dye block phase diagram I just showed you. And in particular, they found uh, uh, a range of samples that adopted an orthorhombic unit cell, which is already very interesting that it's uh, not a cubic structure. It's uh, triply continuous, so there's a, a gray network uh, uh, interpenetrated with a red network. Uh, or illustrated here in red, blue, and green. Uh, this belongs to space group number 70. Uh, and the experimental confirmation of this structure is based on synchrotron X-ray scattering. And just look at all of the indexable peaks. And in fact, uh, this inset here shows a whole bunch of higher order peaks when you blow up this region. In neutron scattering, you would not see virtually any of this because of the smearing of wavelength and or collimation. You'd certainly see the main peak. You might see uh, a second peak, but that'd be about it. And there are lots and lots of structures that would be consistent uh, with having these other peaks. So this is uh, an extreme example, but a good example of, I would say, the limitations uh, of neutron scattering in terms of phase identification. Okay, I'm going to stop at this point uh, and ask if there are any questions about essentially uh, the, the thermodynamics of block polymers and what dictates when they order and disorder. Uh, so I'll, let me pause for a moment and see if there are any questions. Okay, well, so far it doesn't seem to be any questions, which is fine. I will uh, stop again uh, in a little while, so this isn't the last opportunity you'll have. Uh, but it is it was your last opportunity to stop me from getting into the mathematics. So you've only yourselves to blame. Here we go. Uh, this is not going to be as bad as it looks, uh, but I'll remind you of this top equation here we had last time that tells us if we have two monomer system and it's incompressible, the scattered intensity is going to be given by the difference in the scattering lengths of the components squared uh, and what's called the partial structure factor, S11, which is telling you about the spatial correlations between all of the monomers uh, of type 1. And the incompressibility assumption was the assumption that every place in the sample is, is either monomer 1 or monomer 2, so that if you know where 1s are, then you know by definition where the 2s are, and you know all of the correlations. Now, the partial structure factor for monomer 1 uh, in the case of a, a block copolymer is the following. We have the number of chains, the uh, fraction of the monomers on the chain that are type 1, so that's F times N, 
Uh, and then P11 is the form factor of the one block. So this term is accounting for the correlations within a block of type 1. And then the second term goes as little n squared, and now mind you, that's the number of chains. So this is a chain-chain correlation. So this is Q is talking about the correlations between monomers of type 1 in blocks of type 1 that are on different chains. You have the equivalent partial structure factor for monomer 2, and then you have the cross term, which is the correlations between monomers 1 and 2 on the same chain, so in the two different blocks on the same chain, and then on the different blocks and on different chains. <coughs> so those are the partial structure factors, and in the case of the incompressibility, the answer reduces down to this. But it's instructive to sort of explore this all together. We can create what we can call the form factor of the entire block polymer, and we'll call that P total. And so that would be normalized as 1 over n squared, so I put that over here. And there are four terms. There is, uh, sorry, there are th three terms here. So it's the sum from monomer 1 to monomer capital N times all the other monomers and the average of the phase factor, just like before. So we can break that into the first block, where the index goes from 1 to monomer Fn. Then there's the second block, which starts at monomer Fn and goes to the other end, N. And then there's two terms where you go from one block times the other block. So the total form factor is F squared times the block one form factor, one minus f squared, times the block two form factor, and then this cross term. So you can think of these p, p11, p22, p12 as partial form factors, uh, if you like. So this is a general expression. Let's now just simplify to the, to the most simple case, which is a symmetric die block f equals one half. So this total form factor, now we know that f is a half. So this is a quarter of this one, a quarter of that, and a half of that. Uh, and it can be simplified this way. I'm not going to discuss this, but in fact, for this simple case, the correlations between blocks 1 on two different chains, and blocks 2 on different chains, and block 1 on one chain, and 2 on another, are all the same. And that's actually equal to the correlations between any two block polymers. And with this simplification, uh, the entire uh, total form factor is directly related to this inter-chain correlation function. And if I just go back, uh, actually, I don't have to go back. We have uh, the intensity is proportional to S11. And with this simplification, we can crank through uh, this expression and arrive at an answer to the scattering for a symmetric die block polymer. And the most important thing about this is that it's the proportional to the difference between two form factors, one describing a single block and one describing the entire chain. And that has important immediate results, right? All form factors must become 1 in the limit of 0 Q. So this term becomes 0. So this tells us at 0 Q, uh, there will not be any scattering for the perfectly symmetric die block polymer. Similarly, uh, as you go to high Q, uh, all form factors decay uh, to nothing. So these become the difference of two very small numbers, which also tend to 0. So the intensity, uh, in the most general sense, will have a peak, a maximum, at a finite wave vector Q. And this is completely different from a polymer solution or a polymer blend. So that's presenting this as a mathematical result, uh, but it's actually quite easy uh, to understand where this comes from in a qualitative physical way. So first of all, if I have a, a block polymer that is 
the block A and block B are connected, uh, block A and block B cannot be right on top of one another. On the other hand, because they're connected, they can't get very far from one another either. So there is a preferred average distance between the center of mass of the A block and the center of mass of the B block. And that preferred distance is, means there will be a peak in scattering. Anytime there's a special distance, then there will be a peak in scattering that corresponds to that. Similarly, the fact that the scattering goes to zero, at, that Q goes to zero, is easy to understand. Because you remember that, a, that scattered intensity is coming from fluctuations, a different amount of A in some place in the sample and a different amount of B somewhere else. In a polymer blend or solution, you can uh, have more A monomers on the left side of the room and more B monomers on the right side of the room if thermodynamics allows it. But in the case of a block polymer, once you get to lengths, distances that are many polymers, there's no way that on those length scales you can have more A in one place and more B in another because the polymers are connected, they're 50-50, and so you can only have uh, zero scattering at long distances because there can be no fluctuations at those distances. This effect of having a peak is sometimes referred to as the correlation hole. Uh, the hole is uh, in the pair correlation function that's just telling you that the A block cannot be on top of the B block. But the main result is there will be a peak and that's a result, in fact, for any symmetry. So Leibler uh, computed the structure factor uh, for the disordered state. And here is the answer. Uh, so I've left out the arithmetic that goes into this, uh, but it follows exactly the prescription uh, given in the previous couple of slides. But if you remember last time, we talked about the random phase approximation for a polymer blend. Uh, and we expressed it as 1 over the structure factor. And there was a part that depended only on form factors and composition. And then there was the chi parameter. And so this, the structure of this equation is very similar to the RPA equation for blends. The difference, of course, is that the algebra of these form factors uh, is very different. And the fact that... Uh, it's not obvious that this function, you know, can go to uh, zero, so the intensity will go to infinity uh, at a particular value of chi. So this is one of the first experimental uh, examples of this. So, so it's neutron scattered intensity uh, versus scattering wave vector. Uh, the die block in question is 1, 4 butadiene, 1, 2 butadiene. One of them is deuterated. Uh, the interaction parameter that emerges from fitting uh, is very small. It's about 0.01, but it's, it's not zero. So even though the, these are just isomers of one another, there is a, a heat of mixing. Uh, the dashed curve is the prediction of this equation, this structure factor, in the absence of chi. So no repulsion between the blocks. So that would be for a uniform mixture. Uh, but in fact, uh, this is a, a disordered sample. It's a melt of this block polymer. But the scattering is higher, which tells you that the blocks, the two blocks, are separated from one another to a greater degree. And you can account for that by inserting this value of chi into this equation. And it's also uh, helpful if you're going to be quantitative to take account of the polydispersity or the ratio of the number or the weight average, the number average degree of polymerization. That's also the, true in the case of blends from last time. I didn't dwell on that, but a most completely accurate treatment you would account for dispersity. But it's much more important in the block polymer case uh, because you're looking at a peak. Because you're looking at a sharp feature in the data 
the dispersity can play a stronger role. So that's illustrated here. This dashed curve uh, uses this value of chi, but a monodispersed polymer, so D would be 1. And the dispersity actually moves this peak position uh, a non-negligible amount. So here is the same system, and now uh, what's changing is temperature. So here is this correlation hole peak or Leibler structure factor peak is a function of temperature. So as temperature goes down, chi is getting bigger, so this peak is getting bigger. So that's telling you that even though this is a disordered polymer, so it's just a melt of polymer, there is some internal segregation going on. Uh, between the two blocks, uh, driven by this thermodynamic interaction. And in principle, if you could cool down far enough without it going through glass transition, this sample ought to adopt a lamellar face. It's a roughly 50-50 polymer. But you can now fit these structure factors as a function of temperature and back out a chi. Now one aspect of this data to point out is that the position of the peak is actually moving with temperature, which is not something that the, the Leibler theory anticipates. So that's a non-mean field result, which we'll talk about briefly uh, in a bit. Here is another system from this uh, paper by Christoph Amdahl and co-workers. Now it's a uh, fully saturated hydrocarbon, uh, polyethyl ethylene, sorry, polyethyl ethylene and 1,4 uh, polyisoprene. And this is intensity versus Q for four different samples with different total molecular weights. Uh, these are all symmetric, roughly, so these are 50-50 again. And you see for the smallest molecular weight, uh, sorry, this is the smallest molecular weight, Q star, the position of the maximum is the largest, which makes sense. Smaller molecular weight means smaller distance, which means larger Q in reciprocal space. And then as you increase the molecular weight, uh, you find that the peak uh, position moves. It also seems to get sharper. Uh, but that's a little bit misleading because the amplitude here has been blown up uh, by a factor of 300 so that you could see it. Now, one of the interesting results uh, of this study uh, of Amdahl et al. is they plot the peak position Q star versus uh, degree of polymerization on the log-log plot. And the Leibler theory or the mean field theory says that this should be a Gaussian all the way up to the ordering transition. And then we did the, exper uh, did the calculation earlier that said once it's ordered and lamellar, it should be two-thirds. Uh, come down with a two-thirds slope. Uh, but in fact, uh, experimentally here, it has a stronger exponent even of about 0.8, uh, which is actually a crossover effect. If this experiment had been continued, out here, as it has, has been done in other systems, this exponent would come over to the expected minus two-thirds because Q star uh, is the uh, inverse of the, this distance. But this shows, interestingly, that uh, the chains become stretched or the periodicity is growing even before the sample orders. And this is a manifestation of the fact that the system is able to lower its free energy by segregating the blocks a little bit more, stretching out the chains, but without actually adopting a lattice. So in, actually, in the mean field theory, uh, this ordering transition should probably have been down here somewhere. And this stretching and segregation has lowered the free energy of the disordered state, and therefore suppressed the ordering until you got to a higher degree of polymerization. Here is a, a set of measurements uh, 
more recent set of measurements on an interesting uh, dye block made of this propyl methacrylate and styrene. Uh, and what's shown again is the neutron scattered intensity versus Q. And these are the Leibler structure factors. So at 100 degrees, there's hardly any peak, uh, which tells us that chi is small. In this case, as we increase temperature, chi goes up. So it's going up uh, with temperature. So this is the analog in a polymer blend of a lower critical solution system where the blend would phase separate on heating. And this, so this is a block polymer that orders on heating instead of cooling. Uh, so that's interesting in and of, it, of itself. Uh, but the main point I want to bring out here is if you just look at the peaks, look at the peak intensity, you wouldn't necessarily know that this dark points corresponded to ordered states and the open points corresponded to disordered states. But what you can see, I think, is that the half width at half of the maximum undergoes a discontinuous drop between order and disorder. So the dark points have normalized full half width at half max or full width at half max that are distinctly smaller, distinctly sharper peak uh, than the disordered state. And that makes sense. If you have long range order, uh, then the peak from the, bra the Bragg peak will always be narrower than, than if it's a uh, relatively disordered periodic structure. So this allows us uh, to compare uh, qualitatively copolymers and blends in terms of this transition from mean field like when chi is small or n is big uh, to non-mean fields when a blend phase separates or a block polymer undergoes an ordering transition. So what was plotted here is the inverse of the intensity at zero Q, the susceptibility uh, in the blend versus inverse temperature. The mean field theory says this should be linear. And I, I showed you last time an example. If the molecular weight was small, you got this region of so-called Ising-like critical phenomena. In the case of the block polymer, uh, the Leibler theory says the one over the intensity at the maximum, one over I of Q star, should come down linearly and uh, approach, let's say, a critical point uh, if the, if the uh, composition was exactly a half. But let's just call it the ordering transition. But what you see is that a bend over uh, before that happens. Uh, so the intensity uh, curls off this line and the ordering transition here uh, for this sample actually occurs right here and in the inset is shown this uh, half uh, width at uh, uh, at half max and you can see this sharp drop this is a thermodynamically weakly first order transition uh, at, at this uh, particular temperature in general, this region of non-mean field behavior in, in block polymers is significantly wider uh, than it is in blends. It is also uh, a completely different universality class. So, as I've said a couple of times now, blends or mixtures uh, fall into the so-called Ising universality class, and that's characterized by composition fluctuations whose length scale diverges. In copolymers, the composition fluctuations cannot diverge in length scale because the chain is connected. The two blocks can't escape one another. So what happens instead is that the amplitude of the fluctuations gets bigger. How rich an A-rich region is compared to the average. And there's some uh, suggestion that this falls into something called the Brzozowski uh, universality class, but I put a question mark here to indicate that I would say uh, this is uh, still a question uh, for some discussion and ongoing research interest. Okay, I'm going to uh, stop again and uh, ask if there are any questions about this before uh, moving on to some uh, other studies of uh, 
of block polymers both in bulk and in solution. So let me pause now for, again, for questions. Okay, I'm not seeing uh, a lot of questions coming in, so I'll continue. And again, there'll be a little time at the end uh, to address questions if they come up. So let me now uh, move and give you a couple of examples uh, of using neutron scattering in what we might call a higher order way uh, to gain information about uh, ordered samples. And then we'll move to the solution case. So here's one. Uh, you know, it's an interesting question. Uh, the theory says that the domain spacing should go with the two-thirds power of the degree of polymerization. But can we actually measure the radius of gyration of a block in one of these domains? So here is a, a, a two cartoons. Uh, here's a well-ordered lamellar sample. If we sent neutrons in along what we might call the through direction, we would get co correlations within the planes of these lamellae. And I'll call those directions x and y, sorry, x and z, my mistake. And if we had a mixture of deuterated and protonated blocks, we could measure the radius of gyration components in that plane. On the other hand, if we send the neutrons in along this direction, which is the x direction, uh, we could access the components of the radius of gyration, the vertical one, uh, which is the z component, and the y one, which is in the direction we expect the chains to be stretched. So that requires a couple of things. First of all, it requires production, of, again, of a macroscopically well-ordered sample, which is not trivial, but can be done. Uh, but there's a more serious problem here, uh, and that's illustrated in this original cartoon from this paper of Matsushita et al. When you send neutrons in along this x direction, you will get Bragg scattering. You will see the peaks associated with the lamellar phase, and those peaks are going to be big, and it will be very difficult to extract information about the chain radius of gyration uh, along that direction. And that's the one we're interested in most. So what are we going to do? Or what do they do about it? And there's really a very clever uh, solution. And that is uh, the polymer they're using is polystyrene, poly-2-vinyl pyridine. But the polystyrene blocks, they made two samples, one protonated and one deuterated. And you remember from last time that we could use any mixture of protonated and deuterated styrene blocks we wanted. We could always interpret the scattering as due to the form factor of the block. So if we make the right mixture of protonated and deuterated scattering, of protonated and deuterated polystyrene, the average scattering from this domain will exactly match the average scattering from the two vinyl pyridine domain and the Bragg scattering will be almost eliminated. It's hard to do it pre exactly precisely. But essentially, we're saying the red and the blue would become invisible to the neutrons, the Bragg peaks would go away, and we could extract RG. So that's what was done. Uh, these are the results. So in the Y direction, the radius of gyration of the styrene block was about 25% higher. Uh, than the unperturbed case. Uh, so that's definitely consistent with the theoretical expectation. Somewhat interestingly, the chains were contracted in the other two directions, which is not expected. And I'd say the reason for that is still not 100% clear. Uh, but the main point I want to make is how you can gain this kind of higher order information by a clever use of neutron scattering. And here's another example uh, of, of using neutron scattering to get information that's very hard to get otherwise, and that is to look at where is the solvent if you take a block copolymer ordered phase and add solvent to it. So the system here, 
uh, it was polystyrene, polyisoprene dye blocks. And we compare the scattering if we put it in protonated solvent and deuterated solvent. So the crucial thing is this. If the solvent is uniformly spread throughout the sample, uh, whether it's deuterated or protonated will make no difference to the scattering. Uh, every, it's a superposition of scattering from the, the polymer, uh, which will have a peak or peaks, and the scattering from the solvent. But if the solvent is everywhere the same concentration, it uh, does not contribute anything. On the other hand, if the solvent is not uniform, then there will be a difference between whether it's protonated or deuterated. And in particular, if the solvent collects at the interfaces between the domains, that will give a, a change in peak intensity at the, twice the fundamental, or the second harmonic. On the other hand, if the solvent partitions into one domain preferentially, that will influence primarily the odd harmonics. Uh, and so we can look for that. Now, we can get a qualitative answer just looking at the scattering, but it takes this self-consistent mean field theory to actually extract the quantitative answers. So here's an example. Uh, it's a lamellar styrene isoprene polymer, 70% concentration, and toluene is the solvent. And toluene is allegedly a neutral solvent, meaning it likes styrene and isoprene equally. So we expect it to be uniform, except we expect a slight enrichment at the interfaces. And the reason for that is that, the, remember, the interface costs energy. That's where styrene and isoprene must touch. So if the solvent collects there a little bit, uh, the solvent gives up some entropy. But in doing so, it can dilute the amount of contacts between monomers A and B. And so theory anticipates there should be a little enrichment. And that's, in fact, what happens. So here, the open symbols are the solution with deuterated toluene. The filled ones are protonated. You can see the main peak. Maybe it's a little different, but not something you'd want to uh, make a big deal out of. But if you look at the second order peak here and blow it up, there's absolutely a clear distinction uh, between protonated and deuterated solvent Whereas the third peak, which is uh, out here somewhere, there's essentially no difference again. So the quantitative interpretation of these results uh, gives composition profiles that look like this. So as you go across one period, here's the middle of the styrene domain uh, is about 45% uh, styrene, it's about 5% isoprene, and it's about... 50-something percent toluene. Uh, so actually, I'm, I apologize. This is a sample with 50% polymer. It's not exactly the one that you just saw. And then here's the isoprene composition, and here's the toluene with this little bit of enrichment at these interfaces. And this also illustrates why it's the second harmonic, right? For every period of the structure, every period of the structure, there are two interfaces. So that's a twice the, the harmonic. So that's why that peak is the one that matters. And to interpret the data quantitatively, the, the parameters you adjust are now three. There's chi between the monomers and chi between the polymer and the solvent. But the values that you need are very reasonable ones. You can extend this uh, idea to a very selective solvent, namely cyclohexane. So cyclohexane is a good solvent. Cyclohexane is a good solvent for polyisoprene. Uh, but as far as polystyrene is concerned, it's a theta solvent at about 35 degrees. Uh, so at low temperature, you expect cyclohexane to be very much in the polyisoprene domain, uh, also to go to the interface. But as you increase temperature, it should become more and more uniform. And I'm not going to go through all the details here, but if you just look at the intensity uh, in deuterated cyclohexane, there are big changes in peak height, uh, both uh, first and uh, second. Uh, sorry, I've got to be careful. 0.02. Yeah, first and second harmonics uh, with temperature. Interestingly, uh, the protonated one doesn't change much at all. But the reason for that 
is that in this case, the polymer has no deuterium in it. So cyclohexane and styrene nisoprene, the scattering lengths are not that different. So whether the cyclohexane is in styrene or isoprene doesn't change the scattering too much. But the, whether it's deuterated it makes a huge difference, as you can see. These are changing by factors of 30. Anyway, this just illustrates uh, how you can get some very detailed information, uh, even in the ordered state. But for the remainder uh, of the time, I'm going to turn my attention now to block polymers in solution and aspects uh, having to do with micelles. So as I'm sure you're all well aware, if you put a block polymer into a solvent where the red block is not happy uh, and the blue block is, they will self-assemble into micellar aggregates. Uh, they can be spheres, they can be other things, but for the sake of argument today, we'll just consider spheres. And it's been of uh, long-standing interest to really understand the structure of these micelles in detail. And frankly, uh, neutron scattering is the best technique for doing this. You can certainly learn about the average size by dynamic light scattering, straightforward experiment that will give you the hydrodynamic radius and some information about the distribution of the radius. You can do elaborate microscopy techniques such as cryo-TEM and directly image these micelles. But if you want a quantitative measurement that averages over the entire population, then SANS is the best way to do it. Uh, and the way you do it is you can put deuterium on the red block or in the blue block, and then you can choose your solvent to have some composition in terms of hydrogen and deuterium such that you completely mask out the corona and see scattering only from the core or change the solvent composition or change the position of the deuterium in the polymer and only see the corona chains, everything else disappears. So that was what was done uh, in the study of uh, Juna Bang uh, a decade ago. Uh, so let's just look at, at some of the results that, you can, that, that they were able to extract. So here's some scattering profiles. So again, it's styrene and isoprene. Uh, this is a sample, it's nearly symmetric, 15,000, 14,000. The deuterium is in the isoprene. And this is in a solvent diethyl phthalate, uh, which is a good solvent for styrene. So the deuterated isoprene is in the core. And so you see a certain kind of scattering profile. It has a minimum, and those of you familiar with the form factor of a sphere, it has a minimum in it, so that's not a surprise. As you increase the polymer concentration, that feature becomes clearer. If you take the same polymer, and now it's in tetradecane, and now isoprene is in the corona. And now you see scattering from the corona, uh, and in all of these cases you see uh, fits to the data, which are a detailed model due to uh, uh, Peterson and, and Gerstenberg. And I'm not giving you all the mathematics, but you can certainly find it uh, in these references. Here are uh, other examples. Now is deuterated styrene that's in the corona in diethyl phthalate. And here is deuterated styrene in the core in tetradecane. So you have uh, all of these different curves. Here we do it as a function of temperature. Uh, and what you can see is there's a well-defined minimum in the form factor. So you, have a, you know you've got a, a well-defined uh, spherical micelle, but as you increase temperature, this gets fuzzier and fuzzier. And we'll see uh, what that's due to in a moment. Uh, one last set of data uh, as a function of, of temperature in these two cases. So there's a whole bunch of data, but as you see, the smooth curves fit all of these curves uh, extremely well. Uh, and we can extract quantitative information uh, about the micelles. So here, Q, capital Q, perhaps not a good term, but anyway, that's what it is. This is the aggregation number. So what you see in this particular sample, uh, and this is the one with uh, deuterated isoprene cores in diethyl phthalate, the aggregation number is about 180 degrees at room temperature. And down here is the volume fraction of solvent that's in the core, and it's almost negligible within the uncertainty of the experiment. Then as you increase temperature, the micelles get smaller and smaller. And 
that means there are more and more of my cells because the polymers are still in my cells and they're getting smaller which means there's more interface and that makes sense because as you increase temperature chi between in this case the isoprene core block and the solvent is getting smaller so the interfacial tension is less so you can have more interface so the the micelles get smaller in terms of their aggregation number the dropping down to about 60 or so so dropping by a factor of almost three uh, before the critical micelle temperature where they fall apart completely similarly as you approach this critical micelle temperature solvent goes into the cores of the micelles up to 30 percent solvent in the core of the micelle so this kind of quantitative information is impossible to get uh, by other means you might think uh, you could get it from x-ray scattering but in fact it's very hard to convolute deconvolute the aggregation number and the amount of solvent in the core but the deuterium allows us to do that you see the same phenomenology in this case so these are the styrene core micelles in tetradecane aggregation numbers on the order of 160 170 dropping down to about 50 before the CMT no solvent in the core uh, at room temperature but solvent going in uh, to 30 percent or maybe even more uh, as you approach the CMT interestingly uh, as you approach the CMT the core radius goes down that's expected uh, because the aggregation number has gone down uh, but of course some solvent has gone in to take its place but the corona thickness also goes down and so the ratio of the corona thickness to the core size stays pretty constant, in fact. Uh, so that's a, an, an interesting observation be, uh, for reasons I won't uh, dwell on today. But uh, if you read the manuscript <laughs> that's referenced here, you can find out uh, why this result is a little bit unexpected. Anyway, the, the main point uh, here is to illustrate how neutron scattering can be used uh, in a way that gives quantitative information about micellar structure in solution that you really cannot get uh, to the same extent by any other means. The last example of using neutron scattering to look at block polymer micelles uh, will actually be again like, like we did with blends. We'll finish with an experiment that talks about using neutron scattering to follow dynamics and the process we're interested uh, in following here is the dynamics of chain exchange so how quickly does one copolymer move how often does it leave one micelle move through solution and go into another one this is the fundamental process that's required for equilibration of a micelle structure if, if chains can't sample different micelles to find the free energy minimum, you almost certainly have a metastable micellar structure, not an equilibrium one. So the way the experiment works uh, is beautifully simple. You take two polymers, one with a deuterated block here, red, another one with protonated block, blue. You make the solvent purple, meaning a scattering length density equal to a 50-50 mixture of deuterated and protonated chains. You prepare the deuterated micelles separately and the protonated ones separately. Then you mix them, put the sample in the beam at the temperature you want to watch, and as chains exchange between micelles, eventually the average micelle has 50% protonated, 50% deuterated. The core will disappear into the background the corona scattering may be still there but it's pretty weak and so you can follow directly the equilibration process so here's uh, an example quantitative example of this uh, in this case the core block is styrene so some are protonated some deuterated the corona block is this polyethylene all propylene the solvent is uh, squalane which is uh, C32 uh, saturated hydrocarbon uh, that can be obtained protonated and deuterated so this is the neutron scattering intensity so here's the solvent so that's here uh, here are the deuterated styrene micelles so that's the square 
and comes down as a minimum goes up. That's the form factor of a sphere uh, that's being fit. The hydrogenous micelles, the scattering from the core and the corona is not so distinct, and so that curve is this one is quite different. When we mix these two micelles together at room temperature, styrene is a glass, so there's no rearrangement, no exchange possible. And we call that a post-mixed sample, so that's these stars. And in fact, if you take 50% of the deuterated curve and 50% uh, of the protonated curve, you will get this. So this is a random mixture of the two types of micelles. On the other hand, if we take the two polymers and mix them before we make micelles, so we make micelles that have a 50-50, on average, protonated and deuterated core, we call that premixed, and that scattering is down here with the solvent. There is some scattering at lower Q due to the corona. Okay, so now the experiment is to take a post-mixed sample here and anneal it at some temperature where exchange takes place and watch the intensity shrink down to this expected background. So here's an example of exactly that. Uh, so from all of this, so here's the sample when you began a couple of minutes, something happens, uh, but even by uh, several hours, uh, you can see that there's still some, well, this one is four hours. You can see there's still some residual scattering. So this is a, a, a relaxation function for the scattered intensity. It was originally proposed by Ryder Lund and, and co-workers who've also done some of the pioneering measurements of these of this type of, of micellar exchange. So what is this? Well, the intensity that you measure is proportional to the square of the scattering length density. You've seen that throughout. So for a certain composition of H and D in the core of a micelle, the intensity will go with the square of that. So this relaxation function is the square root of the intensity. It's the square root of the intensity at time t minus the infinite time intensity over the square root of the intensity at time 0 minus the infinite time intensity. Uh, intensity. So it's a well-defined, uh, intuitively straightforward relaxation function. So here are plots uh, of the results. So here are relaxation functions of, of time for two samples, one with a 27,000 molecular weight core, one with 42,000. Each of these is at three different temperatures. So you can see relaxation is progressing. Uh, a very interesting feature here, though, is this is linear scale versus log. <coughs> You're used to seeing log versus linear, and then a straight line would be an exponential, but this is not that. So this is a almost logarithmic-seeming relaxation function. Now, there's an explanation for this. Uh, the model is the following. The, the, we assume that it's escaping one chain from the core is the rate-limiting step. Uh, and that will depend on the mobility uh, of the polymer in the core and a thermodynamic barrier to pulling it out. So we're saying the relaxation of the deuterium-hydrogen imbalance goes exponentially in time by a relaxation time, which is the time for a chain to escape the core, which is, this is a, for those of you who are familiar with polymer dynamics, this is the Rouse model. So this is a time that depends on the square of the core block length. And then there's a thermodynamic barrier, right? There wouldn't be a micelle if the polymer wanted to come out. So this barrier is proportional to chi between the core block and the solvent and the length of the core block. So this, the result is that the relaxation function is an exponential of an exponential, very strongly dependent on the length of the core block. So we convolute the measured, to get the measured relaxation function, we convolute this kernel for a single molecular weight with the distribution of molecular weights. When we do that, uh, we can fit the data if we simply adjust this barrier height and we adjust the dispersity of the polymer which is buried in this uh, distribution function. <coughs> 
And here's the answer. Uh, so we've taken uh, the three temperatures for one of the, those micelles, and we can superpose them by a time temperature superposition shift. The shift factors are shown up here, and they correspond to the temperature dependence of the styrene block uh, dynamics. Uh, the smooth curve is the theoretical prediction. If alpha chi is 0.04 and the dispersity is about 1.05, which is very reasonable, notice that if alpha chi is just 0.06 or 0.03, a very modest change, you get orders of magnitude shift in this relaxation function. So this is a very, very sensitive fit. Here's the higher molecular weight. Notice that it is at the same temperature, something like four or five orders of magnitude different, even though the molecular weight is not even twice as big. So that's just underscoring this extreme sensitivity to the chain length because of this exponential of an exponential. But the same alpha chi, the same barrier height describes this sample as describes that one. So really very strong confirmation uh, of this model. It also shows that this apparent logarithmic relaxation is actually just due to an, a single exponential convoluted with polydispersity. So let me wrap it up uh, there. So we've talked today mostly about block polymers. Uh, in particular, excellent way to look at the structure of a disordered melt of block polymers where it sometimes follows Leibler theory if you're far from the ordering transition, but then you have these strong non-mean field fluctuations and chain stretching as you approach the ordering transition. Uh, I've made this point repeatedly that a combination of SACS and, and TEM is generally a much better route for identifying which ordered phase you have, but neutrons do still allow you to get details such as confirmations of blocks and location of solvent within an ordered state. That's really very hard to get any other way. And then the last uh, section, two examples how you can understand, let's say, the temperature dependence of micellar structure, again, in a way that's just not accessible by other techniques. And then this, uh, what I think is beautiful uh, illustration of using neutron scattering to look at a dynamic process. Again, one that's very hard to, to get at by other means. So with that, I will uh, stop. I'm happy to field any questions you have. And in fact, if you have questions that come up uh, later than today, please feel free to email me. I can try and answer them then. Uh, but I will uh, happily field any questions you have now. Thanks. Okay, so one uh, question has come in from Ryan. Uh, is there a condition where a deuterated solvent and a protonated solvent will have an observable effect? Uh, similar to blending the D polymer and the H polymer? Yeah, the answer, the answer is yes. So, in fact, last time uh, I gave these numerical uh, results that if you take polystyrene and cyclohexane, its theta temperature is 35 degrees. If you deuterate one component or the other, it, it shifts by four or five degrees. So that you know, the theta point is, is a magic temperature, let's say. So when you're poised at a magic temperature, the effect of deuteration, you know, is enough to move you off that temperature by a little bit. So four degrees out of 400 Kelvin, you know, is on the order of a 1% effect. Uh, but again, that's pretty much a special case. So in uh, kinds of studies I've shown, here, that uh, the, the deuteration effect is probably pretty modest and, and not, uh, you know, the fact that you've deuterated the solvent uh, is not going to change anything that you see. Uh, I'm not actually intimately familiar with this, but people, uh, of course, use uh, neutron scattering to look in detail at proteins and uh, you know, if I were doing that, I would worry very much about whether deuterated water uh, and protonated water were exactly the same from, in terms of what you wanted to learn about the protein. Uh, so so I, I confess I'm not familiar with the literature. I'm sure uh, the experts uh, who 
or in that business uh, know about this effect and, and take it into account. But that's, that, that would be somewhere I would look for some uh, significant possible effects. So the question uh, that Ryan asks is, in this uh, single chain exchange experiments, uh, are the, uh, is it simply due to thermal energy? Is the sample being stirred, et cetera? Uh, yeah, no, the, these are quiescent samples that are just annealed at the temperature. So this is thermal, thermally driven. Um, you know, a pretty straightforward calculation tells you uh, that the, you know, once the polymer escapes from the micelle, uh, it diffuses large distances in uh, small fractions of a second. Uh, so the, whereas the exchange times, you know, to make it convenient for neutron scattering, the exchange times are typically in the uh, sort of tens, even hundreds of minutes. Uh, so that the, the escape of a single chain is definitely orders of magnitude slower than the motion of the chain through the medium. So I would expect stirring would have no effect. Uh, I, I will also confess that I, I don't think anyone has actually tested that directly. Okay, well, thank you all. Uh, good luck. Please do some neutron scattering if you haven't already. Uh, and again, I'll uh, invite you to email me questions later if they uh, do come up. Thanks.